very good morning and I greet you in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Please turn with me to God's Word, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 to 21. Let us read these five verses in unison. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 to 21. Verse 17, in unison, up to verse 21. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as ye know, ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from the fruit of conversation, with sheep and tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a land without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, and raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Amen. May God bless us in the reading of his most holy and the sacred word. Be holy is part of the key elements, if not the hallmark of one who must bear when you realize that you have been chosen by God in these last days. This is followed up very closely with the next quality. Be fearful. I do not know how many of you have received a letter of lawsuit before, but when Dr. To and I received separately our letter of lawsuit from one of our ex-church members, the feeling that I had was something that I do not want to repeat. I've never been served a letter of suit before, but when the letter came, you opened the envelope, and then you looked at it, something that you have never seen before as far as the envelope was concerned, and then you open it as you start to read, line by line, something very frightful just well up from within you that is uncontrollable. It is not something that you can just simply close your eye, wheel it out of existence, and then it disappears. And if they give you a deadline, if no response comes from you by this day, by this time, the judgment will be held against you, and then the court will charge you and will find you, and you will have to pay a penalty to this person. That kind of fear was awful. Because I have to think about my family. I have no money to hire a lawyer. That much I know. And I am forced now to look for a lawyer. If I do not have a lawyer, I pay the penalty. How much? I also do not know and I don't have the money. And if I hire a lawyer, it costs you an arm and a leg because later on I found out it depends on how good, how proficient the lawyer is. You pay. A new graduate to assist the lawyer charges about $250 an hour. And then a more experienced lawyer, not a senior counsel, charges about $500 an hour. So if you have three people there, a, a counsel, a more experienced counsel with two assistants taking notes, that's 500 plus 200 plus 200, that's 1,000. So you go down to the office and you sit down there, you better don't talk about anything else except the case. You don't say, how are you? <laughs> 50 cents. I mean, I'm not kidding. And so most of the time, it's at least two, three hours. And so when you walk out, you just think back that two, three hours have just cost you two, three thousand dollars, more than what you earn in a month. Just a couple of hours. And that is only the beginning. By the end of it, Dr. Toh and I each paid the lawyer, our own lawyer, because he did not go to trial, $100,000 each. I don't have that kind of money. If I sell my HDB flat, 
big chunk of it, most of it has to go back to CPF, I can't take it out. And so I will have to borrow money with whatever left after selling my HDB flat, and then borrow money from who I also do not know, maybe my family members, otherwise I'm going to be declared a bankrupt. Because I don't have the money to pay. And if I declare a bankrupt, I can't be a pastor. Because it's in the constitution. If you're not bankrupt, you cannot be a pastor. And so when I got that letter, these things came to my mind. All I needed to do was to submit, comply, beg for mercy, beg for forgiveness, and then this whole nightmare would be over. And so now you have two options. Trust in God to see how he will provide for your need, or be afraid, be afraid of man, and then let your conviction be compromised. This was the battle within. Now this kind of fear is awful because it causes you to want to disobey God's word. It forces you to re-evaluate your conviction that you know is Bible-based. But because of certain personal fear for myself or my family, situational ethics, experience, all kinds of ideas will begin to flow into your mind to try to fix this problem. And most of these ideas would result in compromise and sin. Satan had always been using fear to control people, this world. He has tried, and he had succeeded very, very well. You look at Hitler, how he used his SS troops to instill fear in his whole nation, especially those who are against him, especially those who are of a certain race that he's despised. He would just simply come into your home, he would just simply rob you of all your belongings, kill you, and he won't even think twice about it. And so you become very frightened. There have been the modus operandi of Satan throughout the ages. We never had fear before the fall. Sure, we fear God, but it is a kind of reverential, not the kind of fear that is cringing, not the kind of fear that you and I experience nowadays. We all know what fear is. You don't have to explain it since we are a child. We all have gone through life whereby we have been afraid. And some of us even have our own phobias, isn't it? I don't know what your phobias are. I know that ladies have phobias of all kinds of bugs and insects. But sometimes I find that husbands are more afraid of some bugs than the wife, and so when the bug comes, the husband will call the wife, and the wife will be the heroine, and then the wife will come and get rid of that cockroach or whatever. whatever. There are some husbands that are very afraid of cockroaches. Okay, they are not afraid of rats, but seldom do you find rats in Singapore homes except hawker centre. Right? So we have phobia. Now these are the kind of fears that have crept into us as sinners after the fall. Because now we know that we are in sin, we know we can make mistakes, and we know that we will be punished. But now that as believers, now that we have another kind of fear to overcome the bad kind of fear that will result in sin and compromise. And that kind of fear is a good kind of fear. Because we need this fear because we may not have the sinful nature after salvation because that part has been crucified. That part has died with Christ. So as a Christian, please do not pray that we are totally depraved. We are no longer unless you are not a believer. Please don't use the phrase sinful nature. Why we sin is because of this flesh that we are in. Study Romans chapter 7 carefully. But the sinful nature belongs to the old man where he was a slave to sin, master. His master was sin. That was the old man. But now that we are born again, and the journey, the Bible tells us, that begins our salvation was the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And this is the good kind of fear. This is the fear that God tells us as Christians must continue to remain in our hearts. You cannot say, well, once upon a time I fear God in my beginning of my salvation. That's why Jesus says in the Beatitude, bankruptcy of spirit. How to reduce a person whereby he becomes so bankrupt in his own soul 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. The word poor there is the poorest of all the poor compared to the widow with two mites. This man was a beggar. She would be seen by, from him, by him, from his perspective, as very rich. That word describes a man who sits in a dark corner with his hand up, so ashamed that he does not even want to look up. He just put his hand up in a dark corner, please don't see me, just see my hands and drop something into it. Now how to reduce people like us, with our own home, with a comfortable life, with a bank account, with our education, with our confidence in ourselves. How to reduce that person into that state of a beggarly spirit. Put the fear of God in him. That's the way to do it. How to put the fear of God in him? Use the Ten Commandments. That's the purpose of the Ten Commandments. List them down one by one, and you will be able to tear apart any human confidence. That's the way to do it. Using the Ten Commandments to put the fear of God in him, to let the person know that one day, your body, this is what is so alive now, will one day be in a coffin, and your face will be pale and white, and you will have to answer to God for all that you have done, for every word that you have spoken, for every thought that you have thought, and for every motive that controlled your heart. Put the fear of God, you're not going to escape. No one has, no one can, no one will, not even Satan. And this fear of God that started our journey of salvation, Peter says to all of us this morning, let this continue in order that you may be a chosen generation pleasing to God. Fear Him. And if ye call on the Father, verse 17, you call on the Father, the word call there is the idea of worship, testimony, singing, which you just did with your hymn. You call on the Father, you call yourself a Christian, you sing to the Father, you ask the Lord to help you, to sustain you, you want to praise Him, you want to worship Him, fine, good. But know who He is. Know who the Father is. Peter is very clear, if he called on the Father, he didn't use the personal pronoun, our Father. He is only presumptuous, because there are many wolves in sheep's clothing, messengers of light, sent in by Satan, who comes into churches and pretend to call on the Father, not our. He doesn't want to presumptuous to think that they are believers. He's not saying that he is not a believer, Peter. He knows he's a believer. His life with Christ, when Jesus was on earth, walking on the earth, he knew he was a believer already. Sure, he struggled a lot. He is the man who really understood fear. He was the one who denied the Lord three times, not in front of big, giant soldiers. Women, because he saw what they did to Christ in his mock trial and how they were buffeting him, how they were crucified, he was about to crucify him with all the persecution and the humiliation. He got scared. He was frightened. That kind of fear from the evil one crippled him. And he denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times. So now when he shared this verse with us, please understand it is not just from a man who is giving us a right theology and in theory. He's giving us a right theology from personal experience. He understood what fear of man was all about. And as long as you fear man, fear death, fear the future, fear, 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 you're going to be crippled. And in order to fix and get rid of all the other kind of fear, you must have the right fear. You mean I must be fearful? Yes, you and I have to be fearful all our lives. This fear is very needful and important. So you call on the Father, very good. Now who is the Father? There are many, many adjectives, many, many phrases and clauses that could be used to describe him. But in this particular context, in order to drive home the important thrust of the last part of verse 17, Peter qualified the father in this manner. Who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work? Wow. Who without respect of persons? But I am the founder of this church. God says, excuse me, 
You are the founder of the church? So therefore, what does that mean? What does that mean? That means you can sin and God is supposed to give you some leeway? Never mind, it's okay. Because you are the founder? But I have given my life to serve you full time, Lord. What does that mean? So you can see that God is supposed to close one eye. All right, how many times you want to see that God will say, never mind? Not even for Moses and none of us dare claim that we can spend our whole life serving the Lord to give everything to the Lord. And he won't even come close to 10% of what Moses gave to the Lord. 40 years of his life led a rebellious people of God out of Egypt by a strong hand from God. And from the moment they came out, even before they crossed the Red Sea, the murmuring started. We are now boxed in Moses. Are you sure what you are doing? In front is the Red Sea, behind is Pharaoh with his charioteers. We are going to die. Your fault. Parted the Red Sea. They crossed over. A hymn was sung and they were very happy. And then the moment they ran out of water, murmur and complain. Mara, bitter water, complain some more before Elim came. God warned them. You go through life, you go through trials and testings. It is to test your faith in me. I could easily have given you Elim first. Fresh water, more than you need. But God said, I give you Mara first, bitter water, so that you may learn to trust me. No food, complain again, again and again and again. And Moses interceded for them. And finally, when they made the golden cup, Moses interceded for them again. And when they were about to enter the promised land, 10 spies convinced the whole nation, we cannot go in, we cannot go in. Joshua and Caleb warned them, please let your heart be strengthened. Listen to us, we can go in. They said, no, we cannot go in. That was it, 40 years of wilderness wandering. And all those 20 years and above, 603,548 of them, minus two, Joshua and Caleb, they all died in the wilderness. And Moses accompanied them. And on both occasions, the golden calf, Moses interceded, or else Aaron would have been killed too. And after that incident, if you study the book of Deuteronomy very carefully, when that incident took place, Moses pleaded with God. He fasted another 40 days and 40 nights. All in all, Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Do you know how many times? How many times? You did the book of Exodus, right? How many times? You forgot. <laughs> Four times. First time, collected the Ten Commandments, right? Second time, because of the golden calf, fasted 40 days and 40 nights at the foot. He built a little tent and he went in there. And then the third time, God said, you come back up now, I'll give you a second set of the Ten Commandments. Third time. And the fourth time, when they said we cannot enter the promised land, he fasted again. It's all in the book of Deuteronomy. Another 40 times. 40 days and 40 nights. Prayed and fasted for the people of Israel. Over and over and over again. And then at the last moment, Moses forgot. He has forgotten that he was just an instrument in the Father's hand. He thought that he was his own person. He thought he was his own instrument. And when God asked him to speak to the rock, he smote the rock twice. And for that public sin, God said to Moses, you will not be allowed to enter the promised land. The people murmur, complain, murmur, complain, murmur, complain throughout the 40 plus, 40 years. Moses just won. And God said, you cannot enter the promised land because of this transgression. Moses pleaded with God, oh, please, please forgive me. Let me enter the promised land. Please let me enter. Stop praying this prayer. I already said you will not enter the promised land. Forgiveness, yes. Don't forget consequence. Don't confuse forgiveness with consequence. Just because God has forgiven you doesn't mean there is no consequence. The best that can happen to you, you go up this mountain and then you look across. You look across the promised land. Remember, remember this. If Moses were to be allowed to enter the promised land, and God said, 
never mind. You have done so much. All these 39 plus years, you have been so faithful, all right? This sin, never mind. No consequence. You can go in. What message will God send to the rest of Israel? What message? You know the message. Favoritism. God used him so mightily, and therefore when he transgressed and he sinned, God just simply bent backwards from close one eye because these are special people. That God does not exist in the Holy Scriptures. <clears throat> no favoritism. That is why God stood his ground, Moses submitted to the Lord, and he did not enter the promised land. You think God will show you any difference? You think God has changed? You think God will now look at you, oh, this man is special, he is sacred, he has given his life to serve the Lord, he has done so much, he is a pastor of pastors, he can preach so well. And so you have your private sin. You have your special sin. So what do you expect God to do? Close both eyes, without respect of persons. He will judge according to every man's work. Every man's work. Does not matter who you are. Every man's work, he will judge. And therefore, pass the time. Busy yourself. That's the word pass. It's not just sit there. That's not the word pass the time. Busy yourself. That's what it means. It's not just sit down, do nothing. There are a lot of Christians who sit down, do nothing. You better be busy doing God's work in your life. Pass the time, that's the word. Busy yourself with your time that you have on here, on this earth, in fear. In fear. Do you know the difference between a stranger and a sojourner? What's the difference? When uh, Peter Joseph first came here, he was a stranger. Doesn't know about the weather, doesn't know about the food, doesn't know about anything, assuming this is the first time into Perth in Australia. Stranger. And then now he is a sojourner. A sojourner is a familiar stranger. Right now he is so familiar, he tells me as if he's an Australian. He tells me what to do, where, where to go, what to eat, and you know, all, all these places. Right? So a stranger fresh to this foreign land, everything is strange. But if you stay here long enough, you're not a citizen. You're not a permanent resident. You're a sojourner. You're familiar with the language. You're familiar with the food. You're familiar with the culture. You're familiar with everything now. But you never forget that this is, will never be my home. I was a stranger once. Even though now I may be familiar with everything, I can speak the culture, I can eat their food, I know how they think, I know why they behave in this manner. But I am just a sojourner. I am just a familiar stranger. And that you must never forget because this word is not placed here by chance. Peter inserted that. He chose this word by the inspiration of God. Sojourning your life here as a chosen generation for God to be holy but always remember as a sojourner. You are passing through this place this world, and one day you're going to arrive home in glory. So pass your time in a very busy way, reminding yourself that you are a sojourner. So when you go back home, it's not my home. Just like this building that you are staying in, it's not your home. With the refrigerator spoiled, are you going to go to the supermarket and buy a new fridge? How many of you would do that? People will call you cuckoo. <laughs> True. I mean, this is not your place. You call the owner, please fix my fridge, right? You're not going to go and buy one, right? But in your own home, if it doesn't work, your wife say, husband, please, when you come home, please stop by and get a new fridge. Everything in the fridge is melting. Your washing machine doesn't work. Buy a new one. But here, you don't. So now go back home have the same kind of experience and notion that you have right here, and now use that to regard and look at your own home. Because that's exactly what the feeling of a sojourner is. You don't forget this feeling, isn't it? Oh, beautiful, it's nice, it's very comfortable. 
For the fan is not yours, the air conditioning is not yours, nothing in there is yours, because you are a sojourner, likewise in your own home. Unless you remember this, you're not going to be afraid of God. Because you're going to hold very tightly. It's my house. It's my money. It's mine. Do you do that? Then you are not a sojourner. You have now made yourself a citizen and a permanent residence on this earth. How to fear God? You're going to fear man because as long as you want to hold on to this thing so tightly, what are the things that Satan can threaten you with? Like what this lawsuit will threaten us with? Threaten us to lose our home. Yes, I'm prepared to lose my home. I'm prepared to do and lose anything for your family, yes. For what? For something that is eternal, for someone who means more to me than any human being on this earth. My Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what fearing God means. You don't want to do anything to make him angry with you. Isn't that what fearful of God is? You don't want God to be displeased with you. You don't want God to be even slightly displeased with you. Don't talk about anger. And God said to us, I am waxed hot with anger. Not just hot with anger. I am waxed hot with anger as if it is melting the wax on a candle. I am waxed hot with anger against Israel when they made the golden calf. And then Moses begged God for mercy. Lord, please don't. Because God said, I'm going to wipe out the whole lot of them and I'm going to restart from fresh through you, Moses. Oh, what a big benefit. Moses, you're going to be the man that I'm going to use to create a new nation for my people. I'm going to wipe out the whole lot because I'm fed up with them. You look at them. Kept on so stubborn, kept on sinning. I just gave them the Ten Commandments. They heard me speak to them the Ten Commandments and did they not say to me that we will obey and accept the Ten Commandments? That was only a few days ago. And now communing with me for the past 40 days, what have they done down below? No, Lord, please, Lord, please. For your own name's sake, please, Lord, don't wipe them from the face of this earth. But what about the enemies, Lord? They're going to think that you cannot take care of your own people. For your own sake, for your own glory, Lord, please forgive. And God did. But when Moses came all the way down, he met Joshua halfway and they walked all the way down. Joshua thought, hey, what is all this singing? Are they rejoicing? This is not a song of rejoicing. They were playing. They were sinning. Worship of golden calf, worship of idols will bring with it the fruits of idolatry, which will always include sexual immorality, fornication, adultery. And when Moses saw what they did, he took the Ten Commandments and he smote them, broke it into the ground. And then the Bible said, Moses waxed hot with anger. Just like God. Same word, same verse, same verse. Wax hot with anger. He had the heart of God. You and I must fear God. When you don't fear God, you sin with impunity. You think that God doesn't see you, think God is blind, you think God's hand is so short that he can't touch you. But when you fear him, and you know that he is a God who is all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, you better be afraid of him. If you continue to sin, you talk behind people's back, you plot and plan, thinking that nobody knows because it is in darkness, it is in privacy, you must be joking. What kind of God do you believe in? That you have just simply shaped him and mold him into your own image and then put him into a little box and then you go around calling yourself a Christian, doing the work of a Christian after putting God into this little box and then as if God is now your servant. Fear him. He knows exactly what is in your heart right now. I don't. I don't care. But you better care what God thinks of you. You better stop caring what man thinks of you. When you want to talk to people about their transgression, inevitably one of the things they're going to ask you is, Pastor, can you please help us to keep it private? Keep it private. They will still worry about what people think of them. They're still worried about how they must maintain their face, their disposition, their name in the eyes of men. 
the only person that you and I must be most afraid of and most concerned with how he thinks of you is God. And therefore, if that is the case, don't do anything wrong. Don't do anything sinful against the scriptures. And please don't think that God's eyes are closed like ours. Please don't think that God doesn't know. He knows. Then why doesn't he punish? Why doesn't he just deal with all these people? Because he has a purpose. He has a reason for your good. He wants you and me to learn to trust him more during times of adversities in your life than in times of plenty. In times of plenty, anybody can trust God. But can you still trust him when everything is taken away from you, when everything around you begins to collapse? During the course of the trial, when the church became aware of it, suddenly somebody, I do not know who that person was, he just put in the offering bag. This amount was not much, maybe $100, $200 for the pastor's legal fees. And that started the Lord moved the hearts of the members of Pandan. You know how much was collected? Exactly 200000 Give me a $1,000 extra. 100000 each. Just perfect. Just enough. The Lord moved the hearts of the people to help us pay off the legal fees. Exactly. And so the enemy of God who tried to bankrupt me, bankrupt us, to make life difficult, God, through all these few years, because it lasted a few years, seen us through. Same for the FEBC Life Church suit. We were told by the court, don't talk about theology, please. This is not the court for you to argue about doctrines. Our lawyer was reminded when he went to get the papers from the court, and then they in turn reminded us, and so when we wrote our affidavit, we just simply defined what the doctrine of verbal plenary preservation was. That's all. Because we were told not to talk about doctrine, so nothing about doctrine, nothing about a treatise explaining how we are alive and all these. And then when the trial came, it was about doctrine. But because the affidavit was not about doctrine, and then the judgment came against us, except for the fact that we are independent. And then when the appeal court came, everything was overturned that was against us. And our own lawyers were stunned and shocked because they have never experienced this kind of overwhelming overturning of the High Court judge's judgment. And what was amazing that all of us praised the Lord for and to thank the Lord for was this. God used three men. Two of them at least were unbelievers. One of them attends an ecumenical church. These three judges, none of them theologically trained. Their judgment was, the doctrine of verbal plenary preservation is not inconsistent with the Westminster Confession of Faith. And they quoted scriptures. They quoted the Westminster Confession of Faith and they quoted a lot of things whereby they succinctly explained the VPP so clearly God tells us, I give you always the honor and the privilege to defend my word. He said to his children, to all of us. And if you choose not to do it, it is your loss. And if you ever do it, don't ever become arrogant. You always count it an honor and a privilege. Because let me tell you, through this incident, I can defend my own reputation, I can defend my own word. And now I'm showing you that I can use even unbelievers to defend my word without your help, including all of us. And that was a precious lesson that I learned. That if anybody attacked God's word, and as God's children, if you don't rise to the occasion and defend God's word, it's your loss, my loss, our loss. Because God doesn't need us. Please understand that we need him. Don't switch the need around. We need him. You don't want to praise him, he can get stones to rise up and praise him. You don't want to defend his word, God says, it's your loss, you be careful. I can defend my word without you. You can't defend yourself without me. So fear him. Be afraid of him. Don't be arrogant. Always fear him. That means don't sin against him. You see, in the Bible, we have two kinds of commandments. The don't do kind, thou shalt not kind, and the thou shalt kind. The do kind. The do kind constrained by the love of Christ to keep you doing. 
The thou shalt not kind, it must be the fear of God that will prevent us from transgressing the thou shalt not. And combine the two, you have a life of holiness. Because the moment you sin, you don't want God to remain angry with you. You repent of your sin. That's the only way. That's the only way whereby the anger of God will not continue to hang over your head. You repent of your sin. You get rid of it. Truly, sincerely, genuinely ask the Lord through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to wash you of your sin. And remember, don't let sin get out into your hands and your feet and your mouth. The moment it starts here, you stop it. The moment it starts here, you stop it. Don't let it get out. The lust of the woman, the Bible says, is already adultery. The consequence, minimal, compared to one who actually commits adultery. I'm not sure whether you're aware of what one of our ordained ministers did. He screened seven minutes of colored pornography inside the worship hall during a morning worship service in Pandan Church. And it was during a gospel meeting and so there were unbelievers there. And his reason, I want to show to the congregation the sinfulness of sin. The end result, he caused the whole congregation to sin. Some of these elderly ladies, it was in the Mandarin congregation, the elderly ladies went up to the elders and said, I spent my whole life trying to get myself away from this kind of filthy pictures. And now inside the worship sanctuary, during worship sanctuary, I have to force, I've been forced to watch all these things. Please now tell me how to get them out of my mind. Now as an elder, you have a member here sick, looking at you and tell you to your face. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? The elder was also present in the worship. None of them stopped this ordained minister, who had been an ordained minister for many years. He was my classmate in FEBC. What are you going to tell him? Tell the elderly lady, I spent my whole life to get this filth, not to let it in here. And now it's in here because of worship. Because of worship. Where is the fear of God in our generation? If you and I fear Him, then stop living your life the way that you like. Because God will not let any one of us get away with it. Please understand. He loves us. He loves his children. He wants the best for us. And the best for us is, please, tell the world that you are a Christian. Which means, tell the world to look at my life. Tell your children, look at mommy, look at daddy. You're going to see Christ. That's what God wants us to do. God doesn't say, don't tell them you're a Christian. God said, please, I am so delighted, I'm so happy to let you use the name of Jesus Christ everywhere you go. Please, call yourself a Christian, but on one condition. Let it truly be the genuine biblical Christ that they're going to see in your life. Is that too much to ask from, the, from God? And to do so, be holy. How to maintain that? Be afraid. Be afraid of God, because once you fear God, you fear no man. Once you fear God, that means, Lord, whatever it is, I will never, never at any time want to make you angry with me. That's what it means by fear God. Is that your heart's desire? Don't ever, ever from henceforth want God to be angry with you in your relationship with your wife, with your husband. So follow the biblical principles. You don't want God to be angry with you the way you bring up your children. Then point them to Christ. Don't point them into the world. Education, education, education seems to be the God of today's world. As if the education of a person is going to get him out of hell. There are so many educated people in hell today. The only education that can save them out of hell is Jesus Christ. And therefore, when you educate your children, please, please understand that the real education is their relationship with Jesus Christ. When you pray for your child's test exams, how do you pray? How do you pray? Lord, help them to do well, help them to be healthy, help them to have a clear mind to recall all that they have learned. Is that how you pray? That they will not fail? What's wrong with failing in exams as long as they don't fail in life? What's wrong with failing in exams? When I was 
doing architecture. And that's what I pray for, Lord. Please help me to fail because I want to know what's it like to fail. <laughs> Seriously. And then I failed in my fourth year because it's a four and a half year course. Well, then when I failed, I was so scared. <laughs> it was terrible because all my friends were now enjoying their holiday. They work in their firms. I got to stay home and now I got to study and study and study. And to pass my read, they allow you to repeat as long as it's not designed. But I learned from that failure that all my passes. The real exam in minor children is not on pen and paper. The real exam is their faith and their walk and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore you pray for your children as parents, as you direct them and encourage them. Son, before you study, please pray. Throughout the exam, before you do your homework, please pray. At the end of it, continue to pray, but this time you thank the Lord for being with you. And that's what we do when we ask our children after the exam, did you remember to pray? No. How was the exam? Easy or not? Did you remember to pray? If they remember to pray, the rest is inconsequential. Because that's where the exam is. If they forget to pray, they have failed even though they get a distinction, whatever it is. Because their life with the Lord is crucial so that when they learn this, when they enter into the working world, they will always pray. And throughout their projects where they're working, like they still pray. Isn't that what parenting is? To bring our children to the Savior, to immerse them in a life of faith and prayer and trust in the Lord. Before they look for a school, you teach them to pray. And then when they get to the school, they find a lot of problems in the school, got bullies here, bullies there, teachers don't like them. Then you remind them, son, did we not pray? Did we not pray and ask for the directors and guide us into that school? If he did, and so therefore, God knows about all these trials and difficulties. And so therefore, don't panic, don't cry, don't give up. Pray and trust in the Lord. Talk to the bully. Tell them, why? Why are you doing this to me? What did I do to you? Share with them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because your life, my son, is a life of witness. As a student, you'll be a godly witness. And godly witness means you study to the best of your ability, by all means. But always help others. Show them that you are a Christian, you are a child of God. That's what parenting is all about. And to do that, you must be an example of Christ first. Otherwise, you will be the greatest stumbling block to your children by telling them to be a Christian when you are nothing but a hypocrite. A Christian only on Sunday, but a hypocrite, a carnal, a carnal person from Monday to Saturday. When you fear God, you don't want any area of your life. And you know what areas of your life is in transgression. And you know God knows. And you know that God is now being patient and long-suffering with you. And don't think that God's patience and long-suffering, they are infinite. They are not. There will come a point in time when your sins are full, God will deal with you because he is no respecter of persons. And remember always, like Moses, one tiny little sin from man's perspective, from God's perspective, that sin of smoting the rock twice was not tiny. For that one transgression, after all these years of faithful service, 39 years, no entrance into the promised land. The higher the blessing, the higher the office, the higher the standard of holiness. The people who were below murmur, complain, murmur, complain, God patiently dealt with them because more is given, more is expected. Same today. So please don't think that because you are a pastor, you're an elder, you're a deacon, you have done so much, sacrificed so much, you can sin and God says, it's never mind. You don't know the God of the Bible if you ever think that way. You better mind. And so pass your time on earth very busily as a sojourner with fear in your heart. The basis for this fear, 18 and 19. For as much as you know, cognitive knowledge, know continuously, know and then you keep on knowing. Ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your empty conversation. Same word that appears in verse 15, conversation. All manner of conversation be holy. In the past, every aspect of our life 
Kosong, God says. That's the word vase, empty. But I'm a millionaire. God says, empty. I'm a billionaire, empty. But I have my houses all over the world, empty. Bear that in mind. We have been saved from this empty conversation, empty life. Received by tradition from the fathers, our fathers, different from the Jewish fathers, but it's the same kind of idea. Whatever forefathers who are not believers have been telling you, get as much money as possible, get as much luxury things as possible, because that equals success. Empty conversation. Get rid of it. We have been delivered from such. Not with gold, not with silver. Did anyone pay God gold or silver to get rid of this old, old, empty life? Did you? If you ever did, please tell me how much. Seriously, please tell me how much. Nobody did. Not with gold, not with silver. But with the precious, not just the blood, the precious, priceless blood of Jesus Christ. That's how you and I have been redeemed with this precious blood of Christ from this old, empty, vain life of ours. What does that mean? So how can that be the basis for fear? Because don't cheapen your salvation in other words. Aren't you afraid of God? God spent the blood of Jesus Christ to save you and me. Jesus Christ came down upon this earth. He walked on this earth among sinners. You know how difficult it must have been for him? You and I don't like to walk around dirty, smelly people, right? Isn't it? But sometimes when you go on mission trips, you have to accept all these as part of the whole mission experience. You go to some of these third world countries, they pack their public buses like sardine. And many of them, because of the humidity and the hot weather, whew, it's awful, isn't it? And then you try to not touch anybody and you don't want anybody to touch you because they are gooey and sticky and they will literally rub their body onto you because you are so tight. And then, even after you got out of the bus, somehow their B.O. remains on you. That the whole day, the whole trip, you just simply can't get rid of them. No matter how many bottles of the feng yao, you know the feng yao, <laughs> it will still be there, right? You know that kind of thing, you just, ah, yeah, you can't take it. Isn't it? Imagine the Lord Jesus Christ, a man who is always holy. Everywhere he turns his head, he says, sinner, 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 sinner. All of sin. And the Lord Jesus Christ came down from heaven's glory, a place that is no sin, a place that is perfect, a place that is glorious. And then he took on the form of a man with one agenda and one agenda only to do the Father's will. And the Father's will for him was that you die. Not just to die, but to die in a manner that was so, so painful and so humiliating, a manner in which you can't even imagine how another human being who devised such a heinous way to kill another human being, to hang on the cross. And before they hung him, they hurt him. They mocked him. You're a king, let us give you a crown. A thorn. Press it down his head. And those thorns were not tiny little rose kind of thorns. They were long and sharp. Blood flowed down his face in excruciating pain. You and I don't even want time in the pinprick. Imagine you have dozens of thorns forcing down your head and they remain inside your head. They didn't pluck it out. They just hung it there and forced it and then it pricked through his skin onto his skull. And the blood came on flowing. The pain must have been excruciating. And on top of that, they covered him and they punched him. And then they tore his back apart using the whips before they force him to carry his own cross and then finally to hang him on the cross. Nail. By nails, not by rope or string, like what you see in Philippines during the Easter period, stainless steel nails, and then you have doctors and ambulance nearby. These are mocking what Jesus Christ has done. You know how terrible it is? 
to suspend your body onto your own nails, whereby your own feet are also nailed there, and then all you wanted to do is to use your feet to prop your body up so that you will not collapse, your lungs won't suffocate yourself because when your body collapses, you can't breathe. You will choke to death by your own body weight because your own body weight will just crush your lungs, you can't breathe. That is why by the end of the day, if a person is not dead, they break his legs. Because the moment his legs are broken, he cannot prop himself up any further. Automatically, his whole body will just hang. And you know what it's like to hang there, where your own body weight will tear through your own skin because the nails are there, and then your cartilage of your hands are there, and you cannot go through and the pain will be excruciating on both hands, on your feet, and on the head and on the back. And his whole body was naked and probably covered with blood. That was how Jesus Christ had to endure for your sins and for my sins. And now you want to sin with impurity and don't be afraid of God? This was the price that God, the Heavenly Father, had to pay to redeem you and me. And now you want to remain in sin and you're not afraid that God will do something to you? You think you have been redeemed by gold and silver which is worthless? This is what it means to be a Christian. Never forget how Jesus Christ died for you. That's why God gives us the Lord's Supper, because we are forgetful. I'm not forgetful. I remember. God says, don't remember in your head. Remember by your life. By living a holy life, by staying away from sin and transgression, transgression of the heart, transgression of the mind, transgression of the body. Stay away from it. Be afraid of God. Don't let God be angry with you. God has no choice, do you know that, to be angry with you if you remain in sin? Because that's who he is. He is holy. He cannot allow us to remain in sin and you and I expect him to hear your prayers, to bless you while you're in sin. Would you do that to your own children? He comes there and tells you, Dad, Mom, I know the principal called you. I know they told you that I have been lying to you for the past month. I know they told you that I lied to you because I said I went to the library, but in fact I went to the movies and I've been hanging around at shopping center for this past month. But that, you know I want this brand new phone that everybody is having. Please give me a thousand dollars, I want to buy it. What would you do? Okay son, take it. You do that? He just told you I've been deceiving you for the past month. And he was not even apologetic, he was not even remorseful, he was not sorry, not even one bit. At the end of it, he just told you what he has done, and then now he said, Dad, give me a thousand dollars. You do that to your own son, but you expect God to do that to you. You remain in sin and you still pray as if nothing is wrong. And you still ask God to bless you, this bless you, that. You are in sin. And God knows you are in sin. And you expect God to bless you? God is not like that. God wants the best for us. And the best for us means you get rid of sin. Is that so hard to do? Why would you and I want to hold on to sin when the sin that you have committed caused Jesus Christ to die as such a painful, painful death? Why would you want to hold on to sin? It's unthinkable. Don't you understand what it's like to be a Christian? That the Lord, Son of God, and the Son of Man had to go through all these in order to save you from the depths of hell and the bondage of sin in this life. And now that you are born again, you say you call on the Father. You know you sin, you have sin and you hold on to sin. At the same time, you say all those words to your Father in those hymns. You are mocking Him. Please, you and I are not redeemed with gold and silver. It is the precious, priceless blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And He did it as a lamb, quietly, not just a sheep, as a lamb. You know how helpless a tiny little lamb is? Without blemish, without spot perfect. That's what Jesus Christ had to endure. Why do you think God asked the people of Israel during the Passover to take a lamb? One year old, without spot, without blemish. On the tenth day. They're supposed to offer the lamb on the 14th day. Do you know that the lamb was to stay in their own home when they bring the lamb into the home to be with them for four days? 
He could have damaged the lamb. The lamb could get hurt if you're not careful. Then it would become blemished. And then the whole Passover would be null and void. It would be safer if you were to just go to the lamb in the morning on the 14th day and in the evening you sacrifice. Wouldn't that be easier and safer? But that would be too cold, too callous. God wanted this experience to be personal, to be intimate. And you know children, when they see the lamb, they will fall in love with the lamb because it is very cute. It is definitely mild-mannered and very harmless. And the lamb will become part of the family for the next four days. But every one of them, especially the adults, maybe the young children, they may not be aware that this lamb is going to be the one that will die for the firstborn son. This is the lamb. God wanted them to become intimate with the lamb. After four days, and then on the fourth day, you take the lamb, the lamb will look at you. They know, the lamb knows he's going to die. Not one sound, not one beep. You take the knife, you slit the throat. And the lamb will just collapse onto the ground. And the blood will just be flow out, and the eyes will be looking at you. Because this is exactly how a lamb was killed that I witnessed. Reverend Aerostone brought me to his brother's farm and got the brother to kill a lamb to let me see what it was like many, many years ago when I came here. And I watched. And that's exactly what the lamb did. The lamb looked at the Reverend Everstone's brother. He held a knife. He just looked at him. He knew he was going to die. The blood just flowed. He just collapsed. And the legs would twitch a bit. The last, last gaps of life. And then he was still. That's how Jesus did it. He could easily have delivered himself. He was God when he hung on the cross. All he needed to do was just to speak a word, drop dead, and everyone would die. But he did not. Why? Because of your sin and my sin. You deserve it? No. We deserve hell, we deserve death, we deserve the lake of fire. That's what we must cry to the Lord. I deserve hell, I deserve death, I deserve to be punished in the lake of fire for all eternity because of the many, many, many sins I have committed against you. But please be merciful, Lord. Save me. Help me. For Jesus' sake, help me. Save me from the fiery furnace of hell and the lake of fire. And if that is truly your cry to the Lord, and the Lord has heard you, and the Lord has delivered you and saved you out of such a terrible, terrible finality, why would you now want to hold on to sin when he has entrusted you with the mission to be a chosen generation to a world that continues to die in sin. How could that ever, ever be found in the heart and the mind of someone who cried to God and called him Abba, Father, from all his heart and then would hold on to sin? I cannot imagine this. I cannot understand this. For us who really experience the forgiveness of God through the blood of Christ, why would we want to sin? And don't feel bad about it. Don't feel remorseful. Don't hate ourselves for failing the law over and over and over again. And then we walk around and then we smile as if all is well with my soul. But you know very well it is not. Please, God is not dead. God is not blind. He knows. And why did he punish? Because he's merciful. He's giving you time and upon time to repent, to fix your life. Before he comes in, you don't want him to come in. You know, every time when God begins a new ministry, a new ministry of witness, he set the standard at the very beginning. In the time of the nation of Israel, it was the beginning of a new witness, the national witness. And so the key individuals in the national witness would be the priests. Aaron had four sons, Nadab Abihu and Ezra Itamah. And in that inaugural service in Leviticus chapter 9, before the inaugural service was completed, two of the sons, Nadab and Abihu, offered strange fire, and immediately fire from heaven struck them dead. Their body was burned to the crisp, but the garment that they put on was still intact, to let the people know that this was no accident, this was a judgment from God. So God set the tone. This is the beginning of a new national witness. This is the standard. No sin as you serve. But subsequently, 
when you think of Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they sin with impunity over and over again to the point where the people despised and hated the entire sacrificial system because genuine, sincere Israelites wanted to bring offerings to the Lord. But the moment they think of Eli's two sons, they shudder so much so that they despise the offering. And God was so angry with Eli because he was a high priest, he should have put his two sons to death for the had done. All he did was just to scold them, give them a verbal scolding, and that was it. And for that serious transgression, God terminated the line of Ithamar, because Eli came from the line of Ithamar, and therefore left only one line, Eliezer. When God inaugurated the church, remember Ananias and Sapphira? They saw all that they had, and they gave only a portion of it, but they gave the impression that it was everything. Immediately, Ananias dropped it. They carried his body out a few hours later. The same question was asked of the wife, Safira. Is this everything? Yes, everything. She also dropped it and died. God set the tone. You come to church week after week. You think God doesn't know? God set the tone. I want holiness. You don't lie to the Lord. You don't lie to the Spirit of God. God knows who you are, what we do, and everything about us. Just because God did not instantaneously cause us to drop there. Please, stop sinning with impunity. Be afraid of him. You have been redeemed with the precious blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And to maintain this fear, look at verse 20 and 21. Who verily was foreordained? Who? Christ. Foreordained, known beforehand by God, before the foundation of the world, but was now made manifest, made plain and clear to all of you in these last times for your sake, who by him, by Christ, we all believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, that gave him the glory, that your faith and your hope might be in God. So this faith that you have, please understand, the basis is the blood of Jesus Christ. And you must maintain this fear by always remembering that you approach God, you came to know God only through Jesus Christ. And therefore, your faith and your hope might continue to be in God, not in the things of the world. That's how you maintain this fear. Your faith means you believe in God. You see, faith is something that is found in the world. The whole world is covered in faith. We have faith in our government. Last night, somebody told me, do you want water? Yeah, I want water. Is it safe to drink from the tap? Yeah, it's safe to drink. I'm taking your word, you know. If I drink and I get diarrhea, somebody's going to take over. <laughs> I don't know this person. I've never met this person before. He looks like a Chinese. That's it. He has two eyes like me. That's it. He has more hair than me. That's it. <laughs> I don't know him. But he said it's safe to drink. Do I need to boil it? You can boil it if you want to, but it's okay. You don't need to save to just turn on the tap. I never drink direct from the tap, even in Singapore. And so I boil. I'm sorry, I boil. <laughs> I didn't drink direct from the tap. So my faith was, yeah, I saved to drink, but better boil. Right? We have faith in everything. You read the carton of milk, expiry day. Okay, this is it. So after expiry day, oh, you be very careful, you smell. Oh, it's a little sour, better don't drink. You read the canned food. This is the ingredient. You have faith in everything. Everywhere you go, you have faith. But the problem is, we have faith in the wrong person, in the wrong object. God says, you must have faith in me, in Christ. You must trust me. I will take charge. I will take control of your life. Don't give up. Be afraid of God. Don't be afraid of man. Have faith. But how to have faith in Christ? Where do I find Christ to have faith in him? He is no longer walking on earth. In the Bible, this faith that the Bible speaks of in verse 21, that your faith and hope might be in God, but where is God? In the scriptures. That's how you find God. So the faith, the object of your faith is in the scriptures. Why do you think Satan keeps on attacking the Bible? He is the only one on this whole earth, do you know, who understands the importance of the Bible more than anybody else. Do you know that? Satan is the answer. The one who can understand the importance of the Bible in a believer's life more than any one of us is Satan. How do we know that? Because he keeps on attacking it. He never stopped attacking it. Remember what happened in the Garden of Eden before the fall? Yeah, had God said? He's still doing the same today. 
because he knows that once a faith in the Bible is shaken, you cannot be a godly witness. And the faith that we have is in the Bible. And when the Bible is shaken, your faith is shaken. When your faith is shaken, your life is a mess. He knows that. That's why he will continue to attack. And that's why a person who has a low view of the Bible, either he has a low faith or he has no faith. Period. Low faith or no faith. When your view of the Bible is the highest, you must also believe in it. Don't just talk about the perfect Bible. Believe in the perfect Bible. What does that mean? That means you live it out in your life. Let it be your guidebook. Let it be the book that tells you what to say, what to do, what not to say, what not to do. That's what it means to have faith in the Bible. And that will in turn strengthen your hope. This world is not my home. You can take everything away. My hope is in the coming of my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. My hope is one day I will be in heaven with God. That's my hope. That's how you maintain the fear of God in your heart. Because the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ was no accident. It was foreordained by God. God knew. God planned this. Please understand, it is not an accident. Please appreciate afresh every moment of every day the great work of salvation that has been wrought in your heart. When you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. Did you not call on the Father this morning? Be afraid of him. Why? Because you have been redeemed with the precious blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not with gold that is cheap, but with the priceless, precious blood of Christ. And to maintain this, remember your salvation has been foreordained by God. That through Christ, you can know God. That you can have faith and hope in God. Isn't that more than enough reason to fear him so that you will not sin against him? Please look into your life. Don't let the fear of man, the fear of death, the fear of the future stop you from doing what is right. Trust him as a chosen generation because if you don't, no other generation would. The unbelievers, they don't. If God's children won't, please tell me, where do I find that chosen generation? Is there a chosen generation of God in BBCWA, plain and simple? If there is not, change it. Don't call it BPCWA because it's not a church. Bible Presbyterian Community Centre of Western Australia. Seriously. You just come together because we are all from the same nationality except for our brethren. Isn't it? Same skin colour. We speak the same language. We eat the same kind of food, all spicy food. Community centre. There are many of them in Singapore. Community centre. And many churches sadly have become community centre. They go to church. They teach each other how to cook, how to bake, how to sew. They are very kind and very nice to one another. You look, love me, I love you. And then you sew for me, I sew for you. You help me change my light bulb, I help you change your light bulb. You fix my tab, I fix your tab. You want this kind of church? Call it community centre. Bible Presbyterian Community Centre of Western Australia. Let's add another C. B B C C W A. <laughs> Isn't it true? Seriously. But if you are a chosen generation in B B C W A, then do it God's way. Be holy. Be fearful. Let us pray. What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts. Uh, what church dropouts say? Why they stop attending church? Now, please remember, sixty-six percent of well, I take the American view, um, they are the most readily available results. They stop attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from